everybody. Mark from Rams up here, back here with another round table with Paul and Ian. What's going on, Ian? Hey, doing good, gents. I mean, we're just enjoying this time off. The summer is cooking. The heat is up wherever you may be. I know in L.A. it's, it's been getting kind of hot. And uh, like I said, the last time we got together, that means football season's around the corner, babies. And I'm excited for sure. Yeah, I can almost, can almost smell it. Uh, what's going on, Paul? Oh, everything's doing doing well. Uh, the weather is beautiful and uh, all about friends and family. Is Long Island like the only place in the country, maybe uh, Long Island and uh, the uh, San Diego coast down here, uh, the only places in the country where it's not sizzling maybe? Oh, it, it's it's cooking out here. Is it? It's oh, really, oh. yeah, yeah, it's getting up there. We get a little bit yeah, of relief every now and then with a couple of drizzles, but other than that, it's, it, it's bacon. Yeah, this weather has <laughs> been crazy. So we got a lot yeah, of things to talk about, a lot of things, a lot of little things been happening. Um, and we are going to talk about something a little more serious at the end here. We'll save that for last. Please stick around for that. Um, but the first thing we wanted to talk about, I wanted to talk about, you know, we we talked several, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe about the moving parts of this Rams secondary, who is going to be the starting safety, who's going to start at the star position. Is Trey White going to be ready to go? What's going to happen with Durant and Yeast and, and uh, Darion Kendrick? And now they bring John Johnson back, which is great news. But man, what do you think this means for the Rams secondary, Ian? Well, I'm glad John Johnson wants to be back. I, I'm pretty sure he's been on multiple podcasts talking about how he wants to stay with the Rams for as long as possible, and he was true to his word. Now, with that, look, at players always can say those things. They want to come back to their favorite team or their favorite coach and play with their favorite teammates. But, you know, money doesn't work out. Maybe the team doesn't want him back. So I assume this is a vet minimum, another vet minimum contract. I mean, based on the numbers not being shared, I want to say that's probably the case. And that's nice that John Johnson's okay with that. And he's someone who re-signed incredibly late last season, right deep in the training camp. And we're like, hey, that's pretty cool. Hey, we'll see where he's at once he gets into football shape. And Eventually, he did retake his starting safety job over Russ East, and he played some solid football for sure, no doubt about it. Had some good interceptions, good tackles, good coverage skills. And I think this signing either means one of three things. Number one, just depth and leadership, right? A young safety group. Curl still young. Kitchen's rookie. Russ East still young. Quinn Lake still young. And they want some, you know, mentorship. In that room outside of uh, you know Chris Shula being the elder statesman right for that group being the new defense coordinator number two things aren't going so great in the starting safety group or the backup group obviously we think Cameron Curl is going to be starting at strong safety that is his strong suit ironically in the box close to the line of scrimmage hitting tackling machine and all that now the other spot, is Quinn Lake doing a good job at the free safety? Or is he better at that big nickel in, uh, star position, which I thought he played really well last season? You know, what is the right combination? Maybe that right combination has not, uh, you know, evolutionized in practice where the Rams and Shula and McVay feel good about that. They may be like, hmm, maybe we should bring John Johnson back. That might be an option. Or number two, it, you know, Russ East, uh, Cameron Kitchens, just them two by themselves aren't cutting it at this moment. So they're like, man, if Quinn Link or Cam Curl goes down, we're in trouble, right? We need somebody to fill in and play some solid football at the bare minimum. So that might be the third option going into this. Either way, happy he's back. Great value signing. I still think he can play some solid football. Is it great? Is it Pro Bowl level? Of course not. It's not the film doesn't lie. He wasn't at that level. But it's starting caliber, and anytime you get starting caliber on the cheap in this, you know, hard cap league, I think that's pretty good. So that's my thoughts on that. What about you, my friends? What do you say, Paul? Yeah, I think uh, familiarity and versatility. Those that was the motivation yeah. behind uh, these two moves. I think the other thing, also going, just jumping right in uh, to to Lake. So I think you know the issue with the star was the kid can definitely play the star. So the, I think the big issue for the coaching staff is they want him on the field all the time, right? So 
If the star's not yeah. on the field all the time, how do you get the kid on the field all the time? So I think this might be one of those scenarios that in maybe on third downs or obvious passing downs, Lake jumps down and then Johnson goes in. So that might be one scenario that like you that. could be looking at. Right. That could be that could be something that could they could be playing around with. You know, yes. as good as Kinchins is as a prospect, we know the Rams tendencies. They redshirt freshmen. That's what they do. So that mm -hmm. could be the other possibility of it. And, and Ian sort of hinted at it. This puts them three deep and not including late three deep veteran wise at safety. So that might be now, you know, Kinchin will be the number four. Lake, we know, is star slash safety. So we're going to keep him out of that mix for a little bit. But yeah. if you think about it now, they're four deep at safety. Rams love interchangeable safety. That's how they play their safety role. Uh, you know, Cur Curl's dynamic at strong safety. There's no question about it. You know, and the way they – it looks like the way they want to use him, that's the way they want to use him. Yeah. So, you know, um, I think, you know, that – that has been the theme for the Rams and all their moves thus far in the offseason, familiarity. They're familiar with the player. The player's familiar with the system. That's what they've been going through on the cheap, too. Puts a lot of depth for the Rams at a, at a, at a position normally. We don't see them really stockpiling safeties like this. This, this is really like a, a you know, sort of rare, away yeah. from their MO, right? Yeah. So I – and I think the other part of it is there's still a lot of moving parts in their secondary, right? They still haven't put that final jigsaw puzzle together because why? You know, you got uh, T Money still not healthy, right? So, you know, that's another factor when he walks in. You know, it's hard to pull the pieces together when all the pieces aren't available. So, yeah, I think, you know, corners yeah. are always tough. Corners yeah, are bottom. always tough to find. Yeah, bottom line, he's a known quantity, right? They know what they're getting. And, heck, why not? You know, um, you have time to figure it out, bring him into camp. Why not see how it sorts out? And uh, like uh, they know what he brings to the table. He's a, he's of all the guys in the, they got a bunch. They got 18 defensive backs on the roster. I count it. Yeah. And, and a lot of them are, you know, we don't know. We, we don't know much about him. And John Johnson is one guy. I think we know a lot about him. And like he yeah. said, it, not pro bowl level, but pretty darn good still. Yeah, we know yeah. he's good for the locker room. That's the other part of it. He's good. Oh, for, the for sure. Room. I mean, he's. I mean, guys, he's part of the 2017 rookie class. Big base for his year. Very, yeah. very remarkable in a positive way that he's he's still here, a part of this great culture, and wants to be a part of it. I mean, it just speaks to McVay and how much he. God, he saved the Rams in a lot of ways, <laughs> didn't he? <laughs> and we're happy John Johnson is, still feels good about that. And yeah, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited for the yeah. signing for the cheat day. Hey, let's move on to the next topic, and it's always my favorite topic. Anytime we get a chance to talk about uh, my favorite player, SJ39, Steven Jackson, and we'll just touch real briefly on his, uh, he joined DeMarco Farr for that podcast, and Paul was saying it looked like he could step on the field tomorrow if he needed to. Man, oh. he is such a beast. Oh. <laughs> and uh, And they talked a little bit about his Hall of Fame prospects and, you know, who knows? It, it's just a shame that he played on such crappy teams, to be quite frank, and it really oh, hurts his chances. But, it. man, he was so good. I, Paul, do you think he's got any shot at the Hall of Fame? I mean, in my opinion, and I guess everybody in this room as well, I want to speak for everybody, I'm sure. Yeah. I, I know my brothers in the Rams Up family. You know, the dude should be a lock. I mean, the fact that we're even talking about this, I mean, there's something very wrong about this system for the, you know, for the Hall of Fame because how can you look at th this, this guy's body of work and what he's done and the seasons he's put together? He was a model of consistency on a bad team. And I'll, I'll just give you, like, one great example. First of all, the uh, uh, interview, uh, Ramley, if you haven't seen it, Ram Nation, you have to watch that interview with DeMarco Farr. So Steven yeah. Jackson makes DeMarco Farr look like he's a punter. I mean, Steven Jackson like could not even fit in the chair. The dude is just massive. And as yeah, an aside, yeah. his son's a running back. Can you imagine being a running back and your dad, Steven Jackson? <laughs> Holy hopefully cow. he's got some of the hey, hopefully he's got some of those genetics in him, man. Oh the, the man. <laughs> I hope I hope Les Snead has circled his graduation date, you know, so they can start yeah. uh, preparing the draft for him. But um, the, you know, they were showing their favorite plays 
And there was one play, they said, it was against the Niners, and all 11 players, they just ignored the pass. It was like when Dickerson played. They ignored the pass, and they w- yeah. went in to uh, tackle Jackson, yeah. and he still fought forward for four yards at a first down to kill the clock, right? And yeah. it, you know, DeMarco Farr picked that, not a breakaway 50-yard run or anything, just to show you that Steven Jackson's career. That's exactly right. Him against 11 guys. And then they showed the others. Uh, Steven Jackson's favorite play was against the one against Seattle when they when he, he uh, crashed into somebody at the three and he kept pushing, pushing, and Richie Incognito. And then Isaac Bruce, I, I forgot about that one. Isaac Bruce came flying over the top. Mm. Oh, man. I mean, that's what the Hall of Fame is about. It's about guys like this. It was guys like, you know, and, and immediately popped into my head was Earl Campbell. Earl Campbell oh, yeah. played on some, you know, they were good teams. They weren't like over the top teams. Yeah. I mean, that dude absorbed so much abuse. Um, but you know, obviously Earl Campbell's in the league on his own. That dude is the, is the man. Talk yeah. about goat, yeah. right? But um, S. Jax is you know, he's he's a very 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 special player. And you know, I'll be honest with you. When I talk about Ram running backs, he's up there, top three, top four, no question about it. All time. Oh yeah. Yeah, what do you got it, to say, Ian? Uh, you know, the early days of watching Ram football for me were all Steven Jackson, truthfully. It's yeah. it's him. It's him from uh, – I mean, guys, let's just put it into perspective. The Rams teams in St. Louis, it was the worst era of Rams football. I'm sorry. It was. <laughs> the, super, the, the, the greatest show on turf was fantastic. We had There was a nice – you know, three, four year window. There was a nice year with Mark Bolger, like once or twice. Let's just be honest. And then after that, it was just really, really, really terrible football. And the only one, or one of the few guys who made Rams football enjoyable during that, you know, St. Louis era was Steven Jackson running for a thousand yards in eight straight years on terrible football teams. It's inc- incredible. I mean, guys, from 2005 to 2012, he had a thousand yard rushing at least. Incredible. Incredible, just like you're talking about. Playing the Rams, it was like, they ain't going to pass the ball. They ain't a threat. Let's load the box, try to stop this monster, and teams couldn't do it. And I think that objectively should get you votes into the Hall of Fame, right? Because I know a lot of times it's like, oh, were you a winning player? Oh, what did you do to help your team win games? Did your play affect your team in a positive way? And yes, those things do matter. Let's no doubt about it. But objectively, how could you watch Steven Jackson or Tory Holt and think, hey, these guys aren't Hall of Flame level players? I don't know how you can think that objectively, Rams fan or not. And I know Steven says, hey, look, I try to block it out. Don't think about it. If it happens, it's going to be a party, right? Rightfully so. And if not, so be it. My life goes on. And that's obviously a good way of thinking about it for, you know, for him personally. But I hope one day he gets in. That'd be fantastic. Just so the NFL fans, our own team, everybody can recognize what a great player he was. Because we see Hall of Famers get in that weren't necessarily winning players, but they were just kick-ass their entire playing career and got in. Why not for you, Steven Jackson? Why can't he be a player like that that gets into the Hall? So Yeah, one of the most frustrating things... One of the most frustrating things uh, I have done as a Rams fan is talk to random fans about Steven Jackson and the lack of appreciation, the lack of awareness of what type of player he was. It's just really frustrating. And I will say another reflection of what kind of person he is. He just wants it to happen while his parents are still alive. He said it's not going to mean that much Mm. if his parents aren't there to celebrate with him. So hopefully it happens uh sooner rather that. than later and, I'm and that's the right type, that's type of statement that steven jackson would make and that's why you know for people to understand you know he is the quintessential player when you talk about like character and intangibles in oh, yeah. addition to all his other achievements you know the one factor i would say if you looked at that you know how many other players could have handled his situation the way he has handled it right uh, with the with the quality of teams that he has played on, the product they put out there, yeah. never played. And not just, you know, talk about yards, but yards from scrimmage. He worked very hard to become a great blocker. He worked very mm-hmm. hard 
to become a, a a dual threat, was great out of the backfield. And people forget he he lost only 15 fumbles his entire career. That's so crazy. He, it's bananas. That's so crazy, dude. It's like 160 games. Oh, it's like it's geez. bananas. So Jeez. he's just he's he's just like uh it's just unbelievable that people are still like you know questioning him. And I think Mark to to your point as well is that the Rams have to do a better job of singing his praises and endorsing him and advocating for him and for Tory Holt. To yeah, go into and, the and uh, right, that's uh, – go ahead, Ian. No, I was saying for Tory too. I mean, go on, go on. Sorry. Yeah, it's yeah. well, Tor- Tory is my second favorite player, so I'm with you on that. And it goes back to what we were talking about before we uh, started the show, you know, the Rams. Man, how great would a running back day at, at SoFi be – bring all those guys together have steven jackson standing next to marshall falk and oh, eric yeah. dickerson and uh, all these guys and and uh, hey let's segue into another running back we want to talk about real, and real let's quick, invite real quick, go real ahead. quick Morgan, everybody out there i just i just i was like wait a minute i have a picture with you go met him at the 2019 training camp and to to speak on the human i mean what a gracious man he was very he was very nice to talk to me and just talk BS about football and a Madden talking about the old man and gives I ventured like, Hey bro, you you know, like I was a one man wrecking crew in Madden for with you. And then obviously you're a one, one man wrecking crew in real life. And just talking nonsense and all that, but I don't know if anybody could see, ah, it's going to be hard to see the picture. I'll have to share it next episode for sure. I have a picture of him and he was a really gracious, friendly, and a true football junkie, and it was fun to talk to him. I'll have to, sh- I'll have to share that picture uh, next time we get together because it's not going to show up on the phone, unfortunately. Anyway, yeah. I just wanted so, to share that real quick. That that's, that doesn't surprise me at all, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what you'd expect of Stephen Jackson. So let's segue right into another running back that was in the news a little bit, Todd Gurley, another Ram great who helped get this franchise turned around, and um, he was on a podcast as well and shared some thoughts on his days with the Rams and, and how he left the Rams. Paul, Paul, which was your takeaway on that? You, uh, you, you listened to the whole thing, right? Yeah, I was, I, that was like one of the first things, uh, before we logged on, Mark and I were talking about, it, and I know Ian probably feels the same way. Listen, that, that was, a, that was an ugly separation. <laughs> we know that we know oh, everything that, that went so down, bad. but you know, and I think Mark, you know, Mark's always been a big Todd Gurley advocate. Regardless of everything oh, yeah. that's happened, so you got to shout out to Mark. But uh, I love the video because there was one part of uh, Ram Nation that you have to watch the this interview. It's actually really, really enlightening. Is that they asked uh, they asked uh, TG Thirty? They said, you know, were you upset when the Rams won the Super Bowl? And uh, he's, you know, I, I, and I'm like, you know, you're leading in. You're like, all right, what, what's he going to say? And he looked right at the camera. He said, dude. I threw on my Ram colors, blue, yellow, and white. He had a smile on his face, man, and it felt so good to hear that. He was yeah. like, he was like, you know, I, I went down there. I was pulling for them. He's like, I wanted AD to get that ring, you yeah. know. And you can, you know, and I was like, you know, in my head, I was like, you know, man, dude, you should have just picked up the phone, called the, you know, called whoever your connections oh, yeah. down there in the audience. They say, listen, I'm coming down. Let's go sit in the box. Yeah. Let's go enjoy this game because you know what? That's what it, you know. That's what it's all about. Listen. You know, Mark made a really good point, Ram Nation, in the beginning of the the segment before we logged on. He said, listen, he was the driving force that got the ball rolling for the Rams. And and it's absolutely right. And if if that knee situation, Gurley would have put up some sick numbers. And so that's what really stood out for me was his positive sort of take on everything that happened, which is really, really nice to hear. The other thing that really stood out for me, which sort of irritated me, because if it's true, I'm really irritated – was that he said, he said, I was ready to go for that Super Bowl against the Patriots. It was McVay who didn't play me. Of course. He, he said, he said, I was ready to go. And he was like, and it's, he said at one point, he just threw his hands up. He was like, I don't know why I'm on the bench. And he was like watching the clock run. So, you know, we don't know what really happened. Um, but, you know, that was a, that was a tough situation to be in in any case. But that will be interesting when more details come out about that. But. You know, Gurley, you know, he is a major component of this franchise, uh, yes. particularly the early part of the McVeigh area. 
era, I should say. He was mm-hmm. the engine that drove that machine. Like Goff should be sending like a certain percentage of his paycheck to Gurley because that play action situation was all on Gurley, man. Right? Oh, he yeah. opened up those uh those uh throwing lanes for uh for Goff and those passes downfield. So um it's really not ni- just in some, it's really nice to see that Gurley had a nice takeaway. Uh, on the situation with the Rams, and you know, it would be great to see him, you know, back on the sideline with the Rams in some capacity, rooting with his teammates. Um, so, you know, he's he's Ramley forever, baby. Dude is a beast. Do you, catch, do you catch any of that, Ian? Yes, I watched the whole thing. Shout out to former Ram Deshaun Jackson, even though that ended kind of crappy too. And and Shetty McCoy, one of the best running backs of this newer generation, no doubt about it. That guy was crazy yeah. too. Um, it just makes me kind of sad because, dang it, what could have been, right, gentlemen? I mean, we talk about Jackson being a Hall of Famer. I mean, if Gurley's knee situation didn't pop up, I mean, he'd still be playing in the league because, guys, Gurley was another special, special running back, and there's no doubt about his talents of what he would have continued to do if he were still playing. I mean, I, there's always every now and then a fun little post you'll see from – you know, NFL accounts, whether it be the NFL themselves and or other fan accounts or other professional football, pro football accounts where, you know, they just they showcase Todd Gurley's yards and stats are still in the top 10. And he's been out of the league for quite some time now. And that's what's insane about it for him to be that productive in that you know short amount of time that he played in, you know, in relative to you know pro football years for a, a top player. I mean, the, the sky was the limit with him, and that's why I get a little sad. I'm like, dang it, dude. Yeah, and, it. and I can, uh, before we move on, I, I can point to a moment in time where I knew McVay and the Rams had arrived, and I don't know if you remember this. I'm going to get some of the facts wrong. It was at Dallas. They were losing in the late in the second quarter. Emmett Smith was on the sideline taking his jersey off, uh, taking a breather, and uh, Jared Goff hit Gurley on a little catch and run slant, I guess you'd call it, for yeah. like a 50 yard touchdown. And the Rams came back and won that game. And that's when I knew. I think the Rams were like, they're maybe two and three, three and two at the time. And um, that was the moment. That was the moment I knew that McVeigh had something going on and, and, and Todd Gurley for sure. Yeah. And, and and I, I like that he was very gracious about, hey, man, like football was not going to – scoring touchdowns was not going to satisfy me anymore in all the yards. And I and I truthfully feel like, hey, look, I, I don't know the guy. I haven't met him. Everyone says great things about him. It, it kind of feels like to me that, you know, that's the positive way of thinking about, man, if my health was, was okay, I'd still be kicking ass. Because it wasn't, I was never going to be satisfied. You know, I, I think that was probably just a positive way of – saying like hey you want me to dwell on my knee and my health no you know i think that was a a positive deterrent if you would like to say when he made that comment to me personally and yeah give him credit gosh dang it i thought i was like dang it man it's just uh uh, one of the biggest what ifs everyone talks about bo jackson everyone talks about other players what ifs right like what if this happened what if this did what if this guy didn't have this injury Gurley is in that top three of what ifs you know for players with injuries and and deteriorating knees and all that but i'm glad he came to the bowl i'm glad he's happy for his Rams homies right ad all that but you know, and if we lived in the alternate timeline where Gurley's knees were still good and his health was not an issue, no doubt about it, Goff doesn't get traded. No doubt about it, we win that 2018 Super Bowl. And there's no Matthew Stafford. There's no a lot of stuff happening. So, oh. hey, you know, the timeline we live in ended up being pretty fun. Uh, but I wish Gurley was a part of it. And salute to you. You're a Rams legend. And I still see plenty of number 30 jerseys around town. Yeah. You know, Gurley's impact on LA football being, you know, reborn in a positive light. He's the number one, him and Aaron Donald were the number one reasons why that happened outside yeah. of coach McVay as well. And to my cat, to Mr. Gurley. And I'm glad he likes LA and stays out here. So maybe. Yeah. We'll to yeah. That was evident play. as well. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. always nice to hear. I think I said, uh, Emmett Smith. I meant Zeke. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know, I know kind, kind of, they're kind of the same guy, aren't they? 
feels that way. Uh, you know, good player, but O line <laughs> elevated him. Oh, right, did I say right. that out loud? Whoops. My bad. Oh, did you say that about Evan Smith? You're going to get some comments. Holy uh, cow. Look at, come on. We cannot deny the great wall of Dallas, objectively. That's one of the best, you know. Yeah. What would Steven Jackson history, had, history. Like, What would Steven and Jackson done behind that line? And yeah, just the what, Steven, you don't have Steven to hit, Jackson could have played center on most O line. Did you see yeah. that dude, man? Yeah. Oh my God, dude! I mean, what, yeah. what did he play at two forty five? He said he he, he, he said two forty something. Yeah, yeah. I he mean, said he played at two forty five. Guys, Jeez. Gurley, Jackson. If Falk's injury stuff wasn't popping up, if Dickerson played behind you know better O lines, but cut Jerome Bettis. Bettis, Jerome Bettis. I mean. Uh, Ryan's running backs are legit. Hopefully, Kyron and Blake Corum can be the next wave we're hoping for, right? But I mean, we, we're we've been fortunate. Rams running backs just kick ass, no matter the era. Happy about that. <laughs> hey, let's talk a little bit more about the behind the grind episode three. We touched on it uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think Paul and I did a little bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, you guys wanted to revisit it. There's like uh, four topics that kind of come to mind. Um, yeah. Ian, is there something you wanted to touch on, especially regarding that episode? Yeah, behind the grind, fantastic. It's our own personal hard knocks, like I like to, you know, like to call it, and it's so dang good. And with this episode, I, I really like the highlights of Kobe Turner and the music. I mean, obviously, uh, if anyone who doesn't know, if I haven't mentioned this already in the pod, I'm, I think I have. I'm a big music guy. I play professional lead in an orchestra. Got the violin tattooed on the forearm as if you can see a little bit so the music's pretty serious in my household as well and it, it's i didn't know that kobe you know was a choir man i know he could sing i obviously had saw prior to this episode that he had sung the national anthem for the laker game that was pretty cool to see that behind the scenes and see the rehearsal and, and all that and and you know puka Nakua being a true rams homie for him cheering him on from the from the crowd uh, as he sung the national anthem, but I did not know that he was professionally trained in choir singing right. at his time at, at multiple universities. And that was great to see. Great to see how that work ethic has translated to professional football for him to be a kick ass player. And th that was just fantastic to see. And gosh, I'm another Rams draft pick that was made to be a Ram, it feels like, fits the culture, is elevating the culture, it feels like. And someone who you can root for, a young player that you hope stays a Ram for a very long time. And Kobe Turner, man, what should have been defensive rookie of the year. Dang it. I know a lot of people who believe that that are professionals as well. And golly, I think that was just fun to watch and see him just see the other side of players that you don't usually get to see. And I'm glad our version of Hard Knocks behind the grind was able to do that for Kobe Turner. And gosh, I'm happy he's a Ram. What was your favorite part of that episode, Paul? Well, first it was shout out Ian Strings and Rings, baby. That's the Rams right now, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Strings and Rings, baby. Yeah. <laughs> right? Violins and rings. So um this was such a great episode um because I had to actually like look at the clock. I was like, how did they squeeze so much into this one episode in comparison to some of the other episodes? There was a lot in this. And I, I just I just thought it was a great episode. And the first thing that right. jumped out at me was with uh with Kobe Turner was um I'm a big John Wooden fan and you know John Wooden always talked about that you know that concept of peace of mind and yeah. and he said the peace of mind comes from from a player knowing one's ability and knowing one's character knowing who you are as a person we had talked about that the importance of of this sort of you know the the Rams culture and holistically developing so that sort of really jumped out at me because, you know, Wooden said you had to be a great individual first, then you could be a great team player. And this concept of like sort of like what Ian was saying with the extracurricular when you're in school and, you know, uh, to you uh, young Ramley members out there, do the extracurriculars, man. That's that's the part that's going to help you evolve, right? Mm. And when you watch that, so did you see how quickly he was able to fit into that acapella group? Do you see <laughs> – Talking, just like instantaneously, that's yeah. the skills that we're talking about as these players are evolving beyond football because mm -hmm. it comes back to impacting their ability to play football. The mm -hmm. confidence level, you could just see his temperament, right? He's calm. He's, you know, he's so cerebral when he was talking to them, right? It, it was just so, you know, for me, I just picked up on it right away. So you can just see that in this particular episode, there was a common thread that I saw 
and all these little snippets that they were showing. And that was all about relating to others. Why, yes. you know, creating these relationships that McVeigh was talking about. And that, remember when, when he and AD were skipping off the field last year? Wait a moment. Think yeah. about that, right? Think about that. So this, this sort of theme of players helping other players on the Rams was in every uh, component of this episode. So you saw it in, the, in that aspect of it. Then you saw it when they were to, when they showed the clip of Cooper Cup and Puka Nails, right? They said we call him uh, Coach Cup, and he's passing along all this knowledge to Puka. So let's yeah. stop and put that into perspective for a minute. He's passing that information off to a second-year wide receiver that's probably right now in a lot of people's mind taking Coop's job, right, theoretically. Right? Think yeah. about that. So think about what type of person you have to be to be open to that. And that's exactly what we're talking about, right? So when you saw that and, you know, Cooper's ability just to, like, you know, explain certain nuances of what was going on, explaining it to these young receivers, to Puka. Mm -hmm. And remember, we saw uh, our boy from Texas, right? Uh, Jordan said the same thing, right? He said, I want to just hang around uh, Coach Cup. And I just wanted to soak everything in. So yeah. I just thought that was was awesome. That was and I too. love the whole running back room, man. That was Coach G, too. Coach G, you are a straight OG, man. That was yeah. awesome. <laughs> you know, the the dinner with the running backs, you know, building that re those relationships. And I love when the, when they showed Iron Kyron and how cerebral he was when he when he when he asked him a question and he looked up on the screen, he pointed some some things out. You know, I was like, you know, he's gaining that 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 football IQ, right? That's making Kyron so effective. And yeah. he said a couple of really important things. He says, see a little, see a lot. In the details, those small details that other people overlook, that's where your understanding of the game will grow. And yes. that was Marshall Falk. Marshall Falk knew everything that was going on in the field every second of the game. What every player should be doing, Marshall knew. So I, I just thought that was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think that's really important because I think the running game is really going to help put forward the Rams' personality. I think it's not going to come from their passing game. We know what that passing game is. That passing game is, you know, you know, deep strike, you know, take big chunks of yardage. This yes. running game, this is the body blows. These are the body blows. It's going to come from Iron Kyron, Blake the Great, um, uh, uh, dog rivers, right? Running rivers. So mm -hmm. this is this is where it's going to come from. And and don't sleep on Scott. Don't sleep on him. I mean, whether it's in the kick return like game man. or whatever. Yeah, I I just I just love the what the whole running back room. I just love the you know the way that unit is gelling and just the relationships that are being formed and just like this whole concept of building relationships. I just thought yeah. it was a great theme and stuff that we've been talking about. We've been talking about the Puka minds that we talk about the Puka power picks that met the mentality that they're bringing to the table. Um, I just thought it was a great segment in, in Ram Nation. You have to check it out if you have it. It's a phenomenal segment. Yeah. And yeah, shout out I, to Colby Parkinson, too, you know, returning back to the Thousand Oaks area, showing him talking to all the high school cats, you know, talking about hard work, you know, and, I, and it's good to get these LA natives back to the area. Sorry, Mark, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I thought that's important to show that, too. Like, hey, we can get these former LA area guys, and I think that also helps the brand of Rams football reach the reach the younger generation, which is what the Rams are hoping for. And I think Colby being back, I think you know when Eric Weddle was here, and you know David uh, Long, others, Shelton, other former LA guys, Greg Gaines being you know a La Habra guy, I think it's good for Rams football, and especially guys that you see play on Sundays, which we expect Colby to, to jump into. And uh, shout out to his dad being out there happy with the, with the newborn or not the right. newborn. Grandpa. Young, yeah. Grandpa there, you know, on family day, McVeigh talking with everybody about family uh, day. I mean, it's Rams Rams football is in such a great, great space right now with coach McVeigh leading the way. And, and this thing, more illustration of that just on display, the culture, Right. What people always throw that word around. What is the culture like? What is culture? You know, it's to me real quick. I'll just share because I know some people get kind of confused with that word. I know I've had this conversation with, with plenty of people, you know, that to me, culture is is a group of people, how they interact together and what is their ultimate goal and how they 
work together to get to that goal. Uh, that's that's what culture is to me in terms of sports. And I think we have a great culture, as you can see, and everyone talks well. And Colby, continue the Rams culture, baby, in Thousand Oaks and beyond because we need it. We need it. And that's why I say and, that. And Col Colby, and that's a great point. And Colby had a great line that he gave to those kids. And, you know, as coaches, right, Every all those coaches that are out there, that's a great line to steal. He said to the kids, to these high school kids, he says, don't confuse your role with your potential. Mm, right? Yeah. He says, just because your role on this team, and think it's from a guy who lived it. Right now, you know, he signed that three-year deal. He's going to get a, a little bit more uh, burn with the Rams. All right, she got he's, that starter money, man. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's, he's so he knows money. he's going to be getting yeah. – he's going to get a chance to throw up some fantasy numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So – and he said, he said, whether you're second string or third string, that's your role. That doesn't mean that's your potential. He yeah. says, keep working, keep working, embrace your role, right? Be the best at your role, but keep working, get better. And that was such a great line, yeah. you know. So just shout out to him for coming com back, you know. And who says you can't go home again? Yeah, I'll, I'll close this uh, part of the discussion. Uh, a couple of follow-ups. One, you talk about culture and you talk about players helping each other. How many times have we heard, well, I think there's a couple of quarterbacks that come to mind who said, it's not my job to to coach these guys yeah. up. And yeah. you won't hear that from a Ram, right? And it, it doesn't have to yeah. be your job, right? It's like Ian said, it's part of your culture. Uh, you help You help your teammates, even if they're competing for your job. And um, and the Colby Parkinson thing, I just thought it was really special. Uh, obviously, just loving to be back in SoCal. That was that was a really cool takeaway for me. And obviously, being close to his parents and his extended family. I think he made a comment. He had two or three relatives up in the Seattle area, yeah. and he's got thirty or forty down here. And that's that's a big deal. You know, that's a really big deal for for all of us. I think to be and, close to and home and close to family. And shame on us for not uh, shouting this out. What did Steven Jackson say? He said that first year I had Marshall Falk. Yeah. DeMarco asked him, right, you know, yeah. like, you know, how was it tough on him? He said, no, I had Marshall. He said, I didn't, any questions I had, I went right to him. So yeah. talk about there, there's your path of helping players out. Probably that impact from Steve Jackson, he recognized it, you know, what an impact that had on his career. Can you yeah. imagine being around Marshall Falk your rookie year? And have, that's like a luxury right. that you can't yeah. even put into words. Yeah, and Marshall could have been bitter. That was when injuries were stacking up. That you know the yeah, writing yeah. was on the wall that they were going to move on. Obviously, get you know taking Stephen and him, you know, being featured more and more. You know, that's just, that's just Rams culture, man. It's uh, it's a, it's a good that thing. Carpet good. over concrete at the Jones Dome, man, just took away. You know, you go I down know. on that carpet over concrete mm -hmm. at the Jones Dome. Yeah. I can't. I can't believe you know that was a thing for such a long time. It's just. It's just insane because I play. I played on crappy field turf in my in my playing days, and that felt crappy to get slammed out or tackled on. I couldn't even imagine those when everyone was wearing shoes running on that yeah. you know that carpet concrete. Crazy, crazy. So, you know, King Cup. I, I'm with you. We can get you know grass in yeah, for right? soccer <laughs> events, right? For Copa America and other stuff, and. You know, World Cup, whenever that, you know, ends up in L.A., why can't we get some grass for our players at SoFi? I know you got some cash, Gronky. Let's let's figure out yeah. a way to do it for our players. Petty so, cash anyway. is what it is. Yeah. NFLPA, um, mark it down, NFLPA. I agree, yeah. Next subject. Now, I'll try to lay the groundwork for this. I did not see the podcast, Cooper Cup's podcast. I did read an article about it, and it was very interesting. He talked about the evolution of 11 personnel and how the way I understood it worked is they were running uh, um, two-minute offenses, third down, uh, second and eight plus yardage plays, and they are running 11 personnel. And and one of the reasons they were doing that was to get Cup on the field. And they started to realize this formation and all the plays kind of kicks ass, pretty much unstoppable in practice. And they started building on the plays that uh, I think they started with six or eight plays. And now they're up. Now, I, I don't know necessarily that they have 700 plays, but they have the 700 series and the 800 series. And it's just grown because it's been so successful. And it kind of reminded me 
I don't know if you've ever heard the story about Mike Martz. Uh, I don't know yeah. if this is an urban legend or not, but someone came up yeah. to him and said, man, I love your third down plays. And he got a twinkle in his eye and hmm, maybe I should just pretend it's third down every every play call. He did it, act like it, that, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it and it worked. And it's it's it pretty it was pretty interesting to hear Cooper Cup explain how this all happened. Almost like Paul, you said it is almost like they stumbled upon it and it works. Yeah. Yeah. And think about it in practice. They they had they had their without even realizing it, they had their best players on the field right in that particular unit formation and yeah. they realize listen this is the most if you want to think about it intuitively for these players and for everything that we're trying to do it comes naturally in this formation and in this setup or whatever it is whatever uh personnel grouping that they had and that's what what cup was saying he said in practice and as as a coach to take that and i'm sure the players were lobbying for that too like they're like we love this let's do this let's do this and so I, I just think, you know, his explanation from a player's perspective really gives you a window into like what a good coach has to be able to do. A good coach has to be able to integrate what the players love to do and what their personal philosophy is and sort of mesh the two together. Yeah. And that the way Cup was describing it, it was like poetry in motion when they were there in practice. And McVeigh said, let's, let's make it happen. Right. And, and, it, and yeah. it did feed into a lot of what, he he wanted to do in any case, and and you know we're seeing it now. You know the uh, the eleven is the I think the Rams are, I think they lead the league in that formation and running. And oh, the yeah. way they do it is just it's just a, it's just a work of art when you watch it. You know, and there's so many nuances to it. And we talked about it in the last segment, Mark, you and I, right? I mean, you could do like ten podcasts on it. So it's just I, I just thought it was great to hear it come from uh, King Cup. Yeah, it was and. And guys, you know, Sean had his time with Washington calling plays and on that staff. He he was known for being tight end centric, too tight end centric. So if you remember those early days of Rams football, you know, 2017, uh, there was more use of the two tight end set. But because Cup was just so special, it was like, all right, how do we get this guy on the field? Because I mean, Cup had said, Hey, he was only getting playing time, you know, at least in practice up until that point of like, hey, second and long, third down for sure, right? And then it was like, hey, this offense is actually, or this 11 personnel, three wide receivers, one tight end, one running back, is just the most effective. And, you know, Sean leaned into his players, which you want any coach to do, no matter what side of the ball that you're coaching or special teams. What does your group of guys do best, and how can that – be cult, you know, cultivated and used to win games. And it was obviously get cup on the dang field. No more. Oh, second and long only. Oh, third down. No, 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 no. He needs to be on the field all the damn time. <laughs> and it's glad that he realized that. It's good that Cup had earned that trust and earned that responsibility, right? And golly, I love that 11 personnel, but I would like to see some more 12 now that Colby is in the lineup, maybe whenever Higby comes back. And obviously I do like what Davis Allen did. So yes. Thank That's you, Sean. For, thank you, Sean, for all the years of 11, and we will continue to run tons of 11. That will not change. But I would like to see go you go back to your Washington roots and we'll get a little more 12 personnel, two tight ends, two wide receivers, one running back. I would like to see that return. But, ah, Sean McVay, what more can we say? Thank you for being our coach. Thank yeah, you we're, we're, pump, we're, pumping up, we're pumping up a couple other podcasts, Cooper Cups and DeMarco Forrest, but it's good stuff. And yes, you, Paul, you said you said everybody was uh, thrilled. I, I'm guessing Gerald Everett wasn't. If I'm getting my Gerald, uh, I was just about to say Gerald talking. Everett, Cooper <laughs> Cup. Was, uh, yeah, yeah, right. And Gerald and, Everett and, was pretty talented. And, he really was. Yeah, Gerald, oh, yeah. Nice they, time with us. they were. They were hoping uh, that, uh, that you know he was going to be that tight end that was going to be like Jimmy Graham esque for the yeah. for the Rams. I right? just had the potential. You know, just, those concentration laps it just killed them. It's just cup. It's just cup. It's just cup. Yeah. Obviously, he 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 snagged his uh, he snagged his way into more targets. I mean, it's like how could you not throw the Cooper Cup in the slot over a tight end? I mean, it was just I get it. I get. And, and when you it. have hey, the luxury you know, of nice career. when you have the luxury of Gurley back there too, you don't have to worry about it, getting that extra blocker there. He you know he yeah. is a uh, on his own. He's like he's a bulldozer on his own. 
Yeah, it's it's the tight end. The tight end spot's hard to get the ball in this offense, but we, hopefully we see a little more increase. Yeah. Like like I said, and we all hope, I'm sure, right? Run the ball, twelve personnel. Let's let's keep teams on on edge. Throw but, it downfield. Those those tight ends on those dig routes, fifteen yards downfield. Oof. Yep. Oh, it's yeah. damage. I think so. Well, we got to close out this episode on a on a sad note. Um, you all probably heard about Kyrie Jackson, the Minnesota Vikings draft pick out of Oregon. Uh, previously played at Alabama and probably the climax of his life getting drafted into the NFL and then uh, killed in a car accident the other night with two other um, former teammates of his in high school. Um, Paul, we talked about him in our mock drafts, right? And we liked him and it's just such a bummer. He's not going to get his chance. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you know, we had all talked, you know, uh, the Rams up family, like, you know, to how we would close out this round table and, you know, and appropriately pay homage to this, to this young man that, you know, I have to say to share that um, his, his post draft interview uh, after he got drafted was just like, it was so, it was so great to watch. It was like watching a little kid and what you know? What we decided to do is we want, we took a, about a minute and ten seconds of that post draft interview. Uh, we're gonna you know out of respect uh, for him, and just wanted to just just you know we prepared just a, a little snippet of you know. Unfortunately, it happened uh, July sixth. Uh, Kyrie Jackson and two of his close friends, uh, Anthony Litton Jr., Isaiah Hazel, they were tragically killed in a car accident in Maryland. Uh, the three were very close friends. They attended uh, Wise High School in Upper Marlboro, uh, where they won a state championship together. Uh, what was interesting about him is that when he went after high school, he went to JUCO, uh, Western Arizona, and he got homesick. And he, in this, he said in his a pre-draft interview, he was telling his story. His story was amazing, uh, and he's saying it with a, this young kid with a smile on his face. And he's saying he got homesick and he wanted to go home and he went home and he worked in a grocery store and he's saying this in pre-draft interview. He's telling everybody he was really proud of the fact that he was a employee of the month. Right. And he, and he, he, he talk about a competitive fire. He didn't just sit on his hands. So he was employee of the month. He, he was working at getting really, really accomplished at NBA 2K. He wanted to be a professional gamer. Mm -hmm. And he had reached the point where he was going to go and see if he could get drafted to become this professional gamer for NBA 2K. Uh, but he eventually returned to football, uh, went to a junior college in Kansas. He earned a spot with Alabama, Crimson Tide. Uh, played there 21-22 seasons, eventually transferred to Oregon for the 23 season, and he earned the honor of first-team All-Pac-12 quarterback. Um, so he realized his dream of playing in the NFL. He was drafted in this year's draft by the Minnesota Vikings around four at pick 108. Uh, it's no surprise that Kyrie was uh, spending time with his family and friends in Maryland after the completion of the Minnesota OTA workouts. So we just wanted to say on behalf of our entire Rams Up family, we extend our deepest condolences to the families of Kyrie Jackson, Anthony Litton Jr., Isaiah Hazel. Uh, there are no words that can ease the loss and sadness that their families uh, must be experiencing. So we would like to close our roundtable tonight and honor their collective memories uh, by sharing a short clip of Kyrie's post-draft interview in which his smile and playful demeanor will serve as a gentle reminder to all of us on the importance of love, friendship, and family. Kyrie, where did you spend the draft weekend and how, I guess, how closely were you paying attention to the pick by pick? Yeah, so I was in, I'm in Maryland right now. Uh, I'm with my, my family. I'm at my dad's house right now. Honestly, I wasn't even at home when I just got the call. I was at the mall. Uh, I was today was like a day I was just trying to chill and like kind of do my own thing because like yesterday it was kind of stressful a little bit for me. So 
today I thought like my name was going to get called a little later in the day. Um, I didn't know it was going to be fourth, fifth uh, round, but I thought it was just going to be, you know, not in the first 30 minutes of the draft. I didn't think that. So I was in a store and I missed the first call. And then I, uh, then my phone rang again, I picked it up and it was, uh, it was the Vikings. And then I'm, I told the lady in the store, I'm like, well, I got to go. And I ran out of the store and I called my parents. I think they was on like pick 105 or 106 at the time. But I called my mom and I told her, uh, you might want to turn on the TV. And then uh, I just hurry up and hung up the phone and then I called my dad. He was right next to her though. Anyway, I don't know why I should have just told them both at the same time. <laughs> but then I called my dad, told him the same thing. And, and then, uh, yeah, it was crazy. Then I ended up coming back uh, to the house and then all my family was here.